Okay, so today we're going to talk a little bit about tripod and what I hope we can take away because I know now that if you're in the metro area, you're a district that's participating, so you know what it is. But as a voice for how can we improve what we're doing and make it a better experience for you as a teacher that translates into a better experience for kids. So we'll talk a little bit about the background. I'd be interested to know how much you knew about it before it was administered and then um, give you a little bit of history how it came about and then look at some actual results and then just end with some Q&A because I'm always a voice for teachers. I like to take back what teachers say about their experiences and for people who listen to try to make our work uh, more meaningful. So let's take just a quick minute and let me just hear from the folks who are not in a district not Metro. In Lynchburg, did you do the tripod? You did. Okay, so everybody's got some idea about it. So I don't know if you feel like this, but when, te when people talk to me about my work in education, I say, my, my job performance is literally in the hands of adolescents. Literally in the hands of middle schoolers. And I tell my kids that. I say, kids, I get a grade, and so do all the teachers, based on how you perform and what you think about the work that we do with you. And so my future is literally in your hands right now in that pencil. So I love that cartoon because I know sometimes we feel like that, like, oh, things are being thrown at me. But to the point of the speaker today, the keynote speaker, the tripod survey is an area where your love, your passion, your care, your concern, all of those things that teachers always say, well, none of that's on a test, none of that's on an end of course test or the TCAP. This is an area where it can be measurable for you. So I think that's a positive thing. And I just want to give you a little background in case you didn't know in our state that when I went to Harvard several, about four years ago, one of the teachers in our institute was Ron Ferguson, who developed the tripod survey. And I came back to Nashville, I was a different middle school principal at that time, and we started working on giving the survey at my own school before Metro Nashville adopted it, before the state adopted it. But what ended up happening from that, he gave it to me free, but woo, it comes with a big old price tag. But in 2013, 17 districts in Tennessee said, we're gonna take this and pilot it. The next year, there were 19 schools that used it as part of the evaluation. So 22 total said, we're going to play with this survey and see what it looks like. 19 of those 22 decided to use it as part of the teacher's evaluation score. So the state board said up to 5% can count towards the qualitative part of your score. So the 50% that comes from evaluation, either from a principal and now not just from principal, but from kids. So where you work, is it 5% of your evaluation as well? I don't, I don't think so. Okay, do you think your district's just piloting it? Okay, so what we know from the state's perspective is they want promising practices. They want school districts to innovate no, they don't require every district to use team. They don't necessarily require that you use tripod, but they want districts to get multiple measures of effectiveness on teachers. And so they will allow a student survey to count as part of evaluation, and they consider that part of innovation. So if you look at the state website, they're really supporting districts that are using all kinds of different measures. So really, when we talk about teacher effect, the tripod survey is not meant to measure content, but it's meant to measure what was it really like for me as a kid to be a teacher with you day in, day out, every year. So we know that a tripod is three different pieces. So the tripod survey deals with the, the nexus, the mix of content, pedagogy, and relationships. So the tripod is all about how did the kid feel? And when we talk about teacher effect and measuring performance, it's not just that snapshot in time, but it's the enduring power that you have to shape a child's future. So we know that they might forget what you taught them, like you'll forget the math formula, 
or you'll forget what the part of speech was, but they will remember how you made them feel. So it's really what we've known from um, the Gates Foundation was they did a huge amount of work in Memphis schools. And they were one of the first seven school districts in the country to pilot the tripod. And so they saw that as cutting edge in terms of reform, education reform. So just to get a snapshot of what it might look like across our state, in Chicago in 2013, Tripod survey was 10% of the teacher's evaluation. In the Achievement School District, do you know what the Achievement School District is? Okay. In Tennessee, the lowest performing schools, about the lowest performing 10% of schools, are administered by sort of like their, they're like their own school district, no matter where they are geographically. And they have their own superintendent, Chris Barbick, who lives in Nashville. In those schools, it counts 15% of a teacher's evaluation score if they are a non-tested teacher. You know, if they don't have a core content reporting their own scores. It's, no, flip that, it's 25% if you don't have your own TVOS. It's 15% if you do. So if you are a related arts teacher or a non-tested teacher, these students survey would be 25% of your evaluation. Now, I don't know that that's the way that we'll go in every school district, but I know that there's a lot of research around the importance of doing that, and we're gonna show you more about that. So, the test scores are really to show us when a kid's not learning content. What the tripod can do is answer why. For a teacher to say, ah, why aren't my kids performing? What did I do wrong? I thought I covered everything. Maybe this is part of why kids don't perform or why we don't see growth. It's that piece that's not about the content. So we're just gonna take a quick listen to some voices from Cambridge, then that's who's developed Tripod. So I'm gonna have two little videos for us to watch today. Care, 
My teacher in this class makes me feel that she really cares about me. She don't really gets me thinking that she does care about me. Because she teaches us to make me feel great. Control. Our class stays busy and doesn't waste time. The area I needed help with the most was control, and that's the one that I would probably thought it was the least uh, one that I need to work on. Clarify. My teacher explains difficult things clearly. Ms. Hook, uh, she explains things to where I can understand it. If you don't understand it, she'll like, stop, talk to you for a second, tell you what it means. It's even like, no. Challenge. My teacher wants me to explain my answers. Why I think what I think. I think the work is sometimes challenging. It depends if I know it or if I don't know it because maybe I might have not like learned it yet. Captivate. My teacher makes learning enjoyable. And I just try to make the activities more engaging and fun. I've heard a couple times the kids say, we didn't even learn today. I'm like, oh yeah, you did. Confirm. My teacher wants us to share our thoughts. So I ask my kids for opinions a lot. A lot of how my classroom runs is based on how my kids have given me feedback, so everything in my class from like our discipline system to how they take their quizzes on Fridays has been built by my students. And consolidate. My teacher takes the time to summarize what we learn each day. Research has shown that the seven C's are connected to student achievement. So one thing we know about uh, positive learning environments is that when students feel welcome in the classroom, they feel that when they walk in the classroom that they're cared about and that you know, there are uh, procedures for how the classroom operates. The students feel that they're in a space where they can really be successful in the classroom. And the tripod survey with the seven C's really gets at that. It's important to stress that the purpose of the student uh, surveys is to provide teachers and principals and district leaders with high quality feedback. At first, there are misconceptions about relying on student surveys. Would children get positive ratings based on who they liked? I don't think it is a popularity contest for me. You say what you mean about your teacher. If you're the best teacher, you shouldn't be like, oh, this teacher does have no, no problems because no one's perfect. Everyone has something wrong with you should say whatever you have so they can improve. But better teachers use the results. It was my way or no way. And I think that might be where the experience, if you have a lot of experience, you're used to, I'm the boss, I'm the teacher, we're doing it my way. So having the experience, I needed to see the results from that. So I get the kids' choices now. I get them more involved. When younger students comprehend the questions. I first heard that my first graders were going to take a survey and try on survey. And I would have to admit, I was a little bit um, skeptical about how they would respond to that. But after really seeing them take the test and hearing and seeing that they were thinking about the questions, saying, oh, yes, my teacher does that. And saying, mm, I'm not sure if my teacher does that, I'm putting maybe. I realize just that they can take a survey like that. I think my you should care about how you feel. Even if you are as young as little Maurice or a graduating senior, teachers are taking what their students say into consideration. Reporting for Pittsburgh Public Schools, I'm Heather Hobson. Okay, so um, for those of you who are in a school that's using these, just on a show of like fist meaning none, five meaning complete, how much professional development did you get around tripod? In other words, how much discussion, let me just start with, how much discussion was there from your principal to you about the tripod survey, with this being none to five being we did it like crazy? Okay, I see like a one and a lot of fists. Okay. Fair enough. I would have to say um, I think our school did an okay job. We could have done a better job. But that's one of the things that, you know, I hope comes from this is how can we help principals know this was important. This is part, this is 5% of your evaluation score for teachers in at least in our district, maybe more in some other districts. Why are we not spending time helping teachers understand what that's about, just like we do with the team rubric? So what are the variables that you think teachers control, teacher control variables that relate most to student growth? Just give me some. 
variables that have to do with you that would determine how well, how much growth score a kid gets. Culture. Okay, competence. Culture. Culture that you create in your classroom. How about years of experience? Highest degree attained. Those are the things that we well, those are the things that we pay teachers more for, aren't they? Higher degree, how much longer they stay, how much how long they've been in a district. But what we know from tripod is that when they, they took in the research, and this is robust research, it's been done year after year after year after year, it's coming out of Harvard, so it's not just second rate. When they looked at math teachers, and they looked at the difference in student performance in those math teachers' classes, the teachers that had the highest tripod score ratings outscored the teachers who didn't do as well on tripod. So assuming everything else is equal, same amount of experience, same degree, the indicator that was related to higher achievement was a tripod score. If you looked at, well, what about teachers who have a master's degree? They're averaging about a, a month's more gain. So, you know, if we're looking for, in the state of Tennessee, a year's worth of learning to be average, we expect every teacher to move the kids ahead one year's worth. If you have a master's degree, statistically, you would take them ahead a year plus a little bit. But a high tripod score is generally equating to about six months more learning than a teacher without a high tripod score. So if you looked at, for example, Teach for America, which especially in metro schools and a lot of urban school districts, we're really using a lot of Teach for America because the research is clear. They get better gains than most traditionally trained teachers in the districts that they work in, urban school districts. There aren't Teach for America teachers in suburbia for the most part or in rural counties. But that measure of being not just an effective teacher, but a highly effective teacher can be highly correlated to scores that teachers get on tripod. And that's something that you can control. That's a culture thing that you can create in your classroom. But how intentional are teachers going to be about that if they didn't even know what was going to be on the dadgum survey to begin with, much less they didn't talk to their kids about it? Oh, man, I'm a big believer in showing that stuff to the kids. As a matter of fact, last night I was talking with a teacher, the teacher of the year, and we decided, wouldn't it be cool if kids, if teachers would show the kids, and you have to modify it, depending on grade level, what was in the teen survey? What was on the teen evaluation rubric? Like when the principal comes in, what are they looking for? Just think how much your kids could help you and hold you accountable day in, day out. If you said, th these are the things I'm being graded on. We, tell, we give the kids rubrics all the time to score their work. We want them to be successful. We tell them, this is how I'm gonna hold you accountable. This is what good performance looks like. What if we did the same thing with this survey? Or what if we did it with team and let kids be part of helping us and holding us accountable day in, day out? So what do you think the variables would be from kids and how they rated teachers? What kind of differences among kids might account for different scores? Well, compatibility is probably a high one how well they get along with the teacher. Okay. So maybe their personalities, their personality. What else? Well, I, I can say, and I have never worked with middle school students, but I'm just thinking for a minute. So I mean, if they're just having a bad day, and, and I think even with some of the elementary students, and my students didn't take this this year because I work with small groups, but I have some friends who had some extra challenging classes this year, let's just put it that way. And some of those kids would come in so angry because of something that had happened at home or something, and that could totally impact for some of those kids how they would fill it out. Yeah, true. Yeah, their understanding. Um, I taught kindergarten ESL children. 90% of my, of my children got the question whether they were a boy or a girl wrong. So how were they, how were they expected to understand yeah. and correctly analyze the other questions when they didn't get that one? Yes, where do you work? Oh, well, I did work in Metro and Okay. 
um, I work at Overton, so my husband works at Blue Cliff. Very familiar with the EL kids. As a matter of fact, in, in the high school version, there were like 70 questions. It was very, very long. And some of the questions were challenging. So I went to the State Department of Ed and said, listen, can't the English language learners in my school who are newcomers take the elementary version? Linguistically simplified, they all measure the same seven attributes. So what, wouldn't it be more fair to the kids and to the teacher and you'd get a better realistic snapshot? And they, uh, they wouldn't let me. They said, well, um, the kids can take it in Spanish. I said, well, we have 36 languages spoken in our school, so that ain't gonna take care of most of them. Um, what else you got? And finally, they said, well, if they're a newcomer, they, can, they don't have to take it. I said, that's not fair to that teacher because I know that teacher is phenomenal. You're robbing her of a, a fantastic evaluation opportunity because you won't help us make modifications. So I'll get off my soapbox about fussing with the state. But your point is exactly well taken. Every test is a reading test. No matter what the content here it is. Every test is a reading test. So some other things that people said, well, what about kids who are poor? Or what about kids who come from you know, challenging homes? What about the kid who has a bad day that day? So just a few things from the research base. We give it twice a year. So a fall and a spring administration. That doesn't entirely take care of what if the kid had a bad day. But what the research shows us is that over time, kids tend to do the same. They, they tend to answer the questions pretty much the same way in the fall and the spring of the year. And even in diverse classes, where assuming language proficiency is not an issue, no matter what the cultural background of the kid was, the kid's answers tend to be uniform. And there are always gonna be one or two outliers, and we'll kind of look at a couple of examples. But for the most part, kids were answering the questions in the same way. Sometimes teachers would say, well, the, this kid's earning a bad grade in my class, therefore they're going to rate me down. That's not what the research bears out. The research pretty much shows that the kids who get A's are only giving slightly higher ratings than the kids who got a D in the class. So again, it's about the culture of the class. It's really not about their comfort level with the content. And then finally to the question of poverty. The research would show that kids who come from affluent families tend to be a little harder on rating teachers than kids who came from poverty. I have worked in lots of kinds of schools, you name it, I've taught public, private, inner city, suburban, rural. It, it, it can be hard to please a family, a community where expectations are very high. And not only does this bear out in education research, it also bears out in, for example, health care. So in wealthy communities, when families are asked to rate the care their provider gives them, they tend to give slightly lower scores for the same service than the families who are not as affluent. So the argument that, well, these kids are poor, so they can't rate me effectively doesn't really bear out in the research either. So I want to take a little bit of a time to, to look at a report. So let me just go back to the question of, I got a lot of fists and maybe one one on how much training you got on tripod. When your results came back, a fist, I got no feedback whatsoever. To five, my administrator sat down with me and we talked about it. Where were you? Yeah, we would love to see the results. Love to see. Okay. <laughs> okay. Who's seen their results? So y'all are making me cry now. We were given access to it, but I didn't bother even looking at it. Oh, oh. That's me. Oh, oh. I haven't bothered look either. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry. an email that said you can go online and look. Exactly. Okay. You know, but they it. couldn't tell us how they were analyzed. Yeah. We asked how what that was supposed to mean, and no one could tell us. Okay. It was there, but you didn't understand it. it they couldn't the way tell us the rating. Okay. I, I hate to say this, but the second survey, when it came along, it was, uh, we have to do another survey, kind of. It really was. Yeah. It, it, and it was not just us teachers, it was from top down all of us. Yeah. Um, when my kindergartners took the second one, we had had, that was the, I think third, maybe fourth 
survey yeah. test, Phyllis yeah. dot ABC as kindergartners that they had had within like a three week time span. Yeah. And they were just like, ugh. Yeah, they just circled whatever they wanted. I mean, they got so tired of the circles at the end. Yeah. We have a lot of surveys. There are only five. I, I know. I mean, there's test fatigue is genuine. I get, I, I know. I had hoped, you know, as an administrator, I didn't want to go in the classroom and see what's happening because you don't want to influence kids. But I kind of hoped with another teacher giving it to kids, you know, that it might have felt a little bit more like a conversation about how they felt and a little bit less about content, but I totally understand it's another set of you know, bubbles to fill in. So, but I, I do think if you're gonna, if like a lot of them are gonna have to, if, if it counts a certain percentage of your evaluation, I think that second test needs to happen because I mean the first one was in the fall and you just got started. Yes. And a lot of that relationship and respect, you know, yeah, you you work on that the first few weeks of school, but also throughout the year you see more, you know, yes. that kind of thing. Yeah. So I think that second one was important. Yes. I would prefer to have it done twice if you're going to have it done and if you don't have it Yeah, agreed. And it, it takes away that, oh, it was a bad day. Right. Or, yeah. you know, we just came out of a pep rally and now you're giving the kids this test. You know, it, it equalizes a little bit. Well then, let's, I'm going to share some scores with you. I, I, first of all, let me just say my school with my teachers. I printed out, I sent them the link as well, and then I thought, this is what's, what's going to happen, is they're going to get an email, and they're not going to go do anything with it. And, you know, whatever, it's got a lot to do. So, shame on them if they don't, shame on me, though, as their leader, if it's important, if I don't. So, I printed off everybody's results for them. And then I took them to a, an academy meeting time and sent them ahead of time just a reflective piece to fill out what was the area that, what was the construct that you did best in? Which one was your lowest? What do you think explains that? What do you think you'll do differently next time? How can I help you? What can I do to support you? And then I just ask everybody to give that back to me and we just had a quick conversation about it. That's what I did in my school. Um, I, I, wish every principal would do that but okay so I'm gonna give you some some reports that if you've not seen them this is what all principals and you have access to in the state database that prints out a score and then I'm gonna walk you through just like I did with my teachers how to interpret a report okay so there is no teacher identification on this these are real results though and I'm going to mix them up. These are two different kinds of people, teacher people. And then we'll, since you've not seen one, we'll go step by step how to interpret one. I'm so sorry, y'all can get to I'm useful for you today. Yeah. So here's some working vocabulary. Okay, these are these are words you might need to know. So I'm just going to hit some highlights. Mm -hmm. Normal curve equivalent NCE. This is something you see on lots of data that we get, usually achievement data. But almost anything from the state's going to have a normal curve equivalent. The word construct that refers to the seven C's. Distribution how the scores fell, like a normal curve. Favorability rating is gonna be overall, how many, think of it in this way. It's like proficient and advanced. You know, when we, we lump those together as kids passed, favorability means kids answered, yeah, the teacher's good at this or really good at this. Reverse coded questions. Generally, the teacher, the question would say something like, my teacher explains things in a way that I understand. And then the kid would say, sometimes, maybe, never. Reverse coded would be things like, my teacher doesn't explain things well. And then sometimes the kids don't catch that it was reverse coded. And then they, they, they're always answering high. Like, my teacher's awesome, she rocks, I give her five everywhere. 
And then on a reverse coded, they scored a five again, and um, that was a negative. So those are some items. And then comparability is obviously to do a comparison. Okay, so those are some. Five years old, that reverse coded question is most difficult. I, it is. When you are five. It's That's hard when they're 15. <laughs> I know. <laughs> it's true. And I, we're not sure why they put them on there. You know, there, there should be a, why can't they just change that? I don't know. Yeah, a friend of mine who's a kindergarten teacher was telling me one of the questions for the five-year-olds was, my teacher pushes me to, and it was something like to excel or think or whatever. Well, the kids were hearing my teacher pushes me. Yeah. And so, of course, they're going to put no. Yeah, I was, <laughs> yes. <laughs> there are lots of stories, like for EL kids. The, the one of the questions was, my teacher is like, treats me like I'm part of her family. You know, like that idea of our class, oh, it was our class is like a family. And the kids went, Miss Jolly, no family. You know, like, she's my, she's not in my family. So they put no. It was like, oh, I know they didn't mean that. But anyway. Okay, so what you see on the first page is on individual results are the seven C's, the seven constructs. And then there's one column with your normal curve equivalent. Can we write on this? Right? Yeah, you can write on these. Okay. There's a school normal curve equivalent. There's a district in the state. You know how when you get TBOS scores, we the state always assumes growth is a zero, and that doesn't mean kids didn't grow. Zero means par. Okay, you didn't go over or you didn't go under. You did exactly what you were supposed to do. On a tripod survey, a normal curve equivalent for the state's always at a 50. 50 just means median, more or less. Okay. All right, so you can see on the boxes up here, I gave all this to our teachers so that they could sort of understand and interpret. The school normal curve equivalent shows how the school compared to all other schools that participated in the state. So elementary compared to elementaries across the state, middle to middle, and high to high. And then there's a, a district normal curve that shows how the district in the aggregate compared to other districts in the state. So on these individual results, you can see the first column, the teacher's normal curve equivalent, and as some of you will see, a teacher probably had a very low normal curve equivalent. Some teachers, the, some of your reports would be very high. The two reports that I'm sharing with you today are from two teachers who have similar experience, similar background, similar education levels, but one is in the lowest 2% in the state, and the other one's probably at the highest. And I've evaluated both of them for two full years, so I know what they're, I know them very well in their classes. Um, so, all, and they don't teach math. For example, the math, this math teacher last night said, hey, have you done any research to see if math teacher scores are lower across the board because kids don't like math? I said, no, I haven't done that. That's a good thing to look into. But these two teachers teach electives. So these are classes that kids chose so it's not as if one got low scores because they teach algebra and the kids didn't like algebra. Okay. So that first page shows you those pieces for each one. Now let's turn over. This was a high school survey. So you can see what the exact questions were. And then you can see under each construct, not only what was this your normal curve equivalent, compared to how teachers in the school did, how teachers in the district did. But you can also see by question the favorability rating. So you see over there to the right where it says school favorability rating 0.73 point. Some of you have a 0.73 and some of you have a 0.15 okay, under care. So a 0.75 means 75% of the kids said, yeah, my teacher cares about me, either a lot or a whole, whole lot. Or in the reverse, 0.15, only 15% of the kids said, yeah, I think the teacher really cares about me. So that's what that's showing you there. And you can break it out 
by question to see the distribution of scores. So what's telling with this is you can generally see, like in these cases, about 24 kids took these survey questions. That was about the average size of the class. I think one was actually 26 and one was 20 or 22. Um, but on average, 24. You can kind of get a sense of were there outliers. In other words, if you see, as you look down, 8% uh, of the responses were always at the lowest end. So somebody answered no, terrible, bad, not good, over and over and over again. It's probably the same kid. It was probably that same kid who was hated you for whatever reason or was in a crappy mood that day. And, and so you can, you can get a sense of, eh, that, that's one kid over and over again who's always just bubbling down, went straight down and made bad marks. There's probably nothing wrong with throwing out the outlier. Likewise, you might see that on the other end. There was that kid that just thought you were the best thing ever and rated you super high all the way across. And then as you go through on the reverse coded items, you can kind of tell, you can see if somebody just Christmas tree or, and went straight down without reading. Okay, so that's what that shows. And there again is the favorability rating explained. If the question was mostly true or totally true, that's how they determined favorable responses. You didn't get extra points if somebody said totally true. It was those two lumped together. Then on the reverse coded questions. Again, when you get your own results, really dig down in there and look and see if you notice that kids didn't read the question well. So students behave so badly in our class that it slows down our learning. Well, if a kid had been used to marking totally true, thinking that was giving you a good score, that, that's messed up on this question. Because you want them to say, no, that's not true. Because it's stated in the negative. Kids behave so badly. No, that's not true. So their answer should have been under totally untrue, where they've already answered 15 questions or 32 on the high school survey where they were saying they were marking on the opposite end. So I tell you that now to know as a school staff, when you go back to school next year, have some deliberate talk with your staff and with your kids about paying attention to reverse coded items. I don't even know that I think that it would be wrong to, when a survey time came, to say to the kids, I want you to turn to question number 12. I want you to put a star by it. That one, pay attention when you answer that one. I don't think there's anything wrong with doing that. If it's going to be 5% of your evaluation score, oh man, be selfish. Don't cheat, but <laughs> be selfish. Advocate for correct responses, is what I'm saying. So, in the end, as a principal, what I can tell you I don't know is I don't know today, because I've never been given any policy guidance, how this report gets calculated into something that is equivalent to a 1, 2, 3, 4, or a 5. Just like we evaluate teachers on team, one, two, three, four, five, you get an effectiveness rating overall as a teacher, one, two, three, four, five. I don't know, nor have I been told, because I'm, I'm old slow, but I try to pay attention, how these numbers turn into a one, two, three, four, five for your evaluation purposes. This is still all that's in the system. Pretty soon when they update, like TCAP scores, I heard they're coming out Sunday, just you know, red alert, red alert. Um, maybe, maybe when you log on to um, code, you know, the state system, maybe it'll show your overall and they'll give you a tripod, one, two, three, four, five. If they're doing that, it's being calculated kind of like in a black box of TBOS style. So 
as a principal, I can't tell you, oh, look at your, look at your scores, you're going to get a whatever. I have been told that no teachers would get below, that no teachers would get a one or a two. I did hear that somewhere because I, I don't know why. That's, I heard that from the state. I read that, I think, someplace. That the scores would probably fall along the range of three, four, or five. Now, as you can see from, I don't know if you're, you got the teacher with the really low scores. If she comes away with the three for that, you know, that's all right. I'm not going to fight against that. Um, but obviously, one of these teachers had great scores. So before we go on, what, is, what makes it good? So the normal curve equivalent shows how you compared to everybody else who gave that same assessment. So if you look at the school normal curve equivalent, you can say, hmm, under the category of care, the normal curve equivalent in my school was 49.81, and I scored 64. So that means, on average, the, the kids in this school think that I'm more caring than the average teacher in this school. So you can do that for each one of the constructs. And then you can compare your school to the district or yourself to the district. So there is some ability in comparability. Favorability rating, how many kids say, yeah, I agree with that pretty much, or holy. That's not really, you can't, there, there's no comparability report for that number right here. Okay. What you can do with that is compare what the kids said on the first administration and then the second administration. Because what that tells you is, did the culture and climate in my school change over the course of a year? You can take this back to the kids after the first one and say, okay, candid conversation, precious no nuns. Here's what you said about me. And either I want to make, I want to do better on this. It, it hurts my heart that you feel this way, but I appreciate your honesty. I wonder what I could do better. You can incorporate some of these constructs into every assessment. At the end of the you know, just how great teachers do. What could I have done better in this unit? What techniques did I use that helped you understand the material? What do you wish I would have done different? You can take some of these and ask kids questions. It can be part of morning meeting. You can have a little box where they could put things in there. You can have a little report card. They could grade you. All these things to make kids, one, know that you care about this. When they come back then and take it the next time, oh man, they know what these questions are going to say because you told them. There's no reason you can't tell kids what this is going to say. There's nothing wrong with saying, I want to get the best scores I can. Help me. Are the questions identical then? Is that what you're saying? These questions from the first survey to the second are the same. Should both of those be in right now? Or in the open? The second one's still not in code. Okay. Only the first one. So you would get, when you do get these scores, you would get this twice. You get yeah. one from the phone. It's yes. not like a combined. Nope. You get two separate reports. You, you get two separate reports. And since this is the first year we've given it twice, we piloted it a year ago, and so we only gave it in spring. This year we gave it fall and spring. And so I have not seen a report that's like a side by side that shows growth. I haven't seen that. Um, so I'll be interested to see that. Okay. So. That, that just kind of explains how you can um, how you can use that for your own growth and then you as a school I mean we were we were clear as a school to say you know, this is th these were our school normal curve equivalents this is how we compare to our district you know what are we doing as a school to improve what are we doing as a school to address this so leaders whether or not your principal takes this by the horns and does something with it, teacher leaders are aware of that. Don't, don't be afraid to say, and we did at, in my staff. I said, does anybody just want to share candidly their results? And I had teachers who said, yes, this is what I got in this area, and I, I'm shocked 
Um, what we did was we did affinity groups. So what was your highest? We had people get together and they talked about what they did. What was your, and then we all laughed over, like these are the teachers that the kids say are mean, you know, because they have these off the charts under control. And then what was your lowest? And we, we just had candid conversation about, oh, this is probably why, or, you know, what do you do? How did you get that high score? So it was very healthy and very normal and very transparent, and it was totally teacher-led. Like, I didn't make anybody do anything. I just facilitated a structure. So if nobody's doing that in your building, go out there and do it in your building. Okay. Um, do, do you have some questions or some feedback? How am I on time, JC? What time is it? Uh, 5 to 11. Okay. Let's just do a little Q&A. That would be more video, but I don't think we need to watch it. So for us who have not received anything, yeah. we just would go ask our administration. Go, go in code. You know how to go in code and look at all your observation scores? Yeah, I did that last year, but I forgot how to get in there. <laughs> Try to remember how to get in there. Okay. What do you, where do you go to? When, when you go to code where you looked at your observation scores, it should be right in there. I mean, you should see a link that you can click on. There might be a tab that says reports, because this is a PDF that you'll download and print it off. They, I don't know if there'll be a score in there, but there should be a tab that says my reports, and then you should click on it, and there'll be a PDF, and you can see it. What do they do? This is just different from things about challenging and caring and all that. What do they, they do with the questions at the end that are about, like, their home life? You know, how many people live with you? Do you have computers? Do you have TV? What do they do with that data that's on there? Yeah. That's not part of, that's not calculated as part of your tripod score for evaluation. That data, you know, I'll give you my it's grant related usually and it has to do with helping school districts um, often qualify for grants so because the kids ask the kids are like why are we answering questions how many people live in our house how many they're like that doesn't do with our teacher yeah well i talked with other teachers that were young mothers and they felt like i don't want my children answering things like this this is a little bit nosy they don't need to know that as a parent as a parent, as a parent, parent, parent what parent rights do we have to even know that this is these oh, questions are going to be asked that not right. and, and yeah. that's and that's my question to you know to anyone to answer yes. because i'm i'm not here as a teacher i'm here as someone who's running the school board and i do have children in public schools and i am a daughter of an educator and i'm concerned yeah and, and i want to know what transparency there is to parents on these types of questions because to me that's intrusive. Right. Now, do you think these tripod questions are intrusive? Are you referring to the I'm how many people live in your home? I'm referring to some of the personal yeah. type questions. With regard to the tripod one, it's more of, okay, well, this is one more one more test. And then it's how many tests are we teaching and coaching our kids to as opposed to truly instructing and allowing each child to live up to their full potential. Is this just another distraction? And is it another distraction for teachers versus unlocking the full potential of these kids? I understand we need to have measures and metrics and accountability, but it seems like we've gone just far by the board. I will say, you know, somebody who works in a school and <laughs> manages the giving of the test, um, we were giving a lot of formative assessments. So we were, you know, TCAP or end of course test are high stakes testing in a small window of time. The tripod survey is about a 45 minute survey twice. So that in itself is not too bad. It was all of the other intermediate, interim assessments that we were given over and over and over when teachers could do what I like to call micro assessments, which are just in time assessments Two or three or four questions related to content mastery that don't require the world to stop turning and everybody need to get out there sharpen number two pencils and we're not leaving the classroom because we're locked down to test. We need to do a better job with that. And we can do a better job with that. Because the frank truth of the matter is teachers are the best predictors 
of what kids are going to do on the ninja course days. You know, you're teaching them the material every day. It's generally not a shock when their scores come back. And there are ways that we can assess if kids are on target without stop and bubble and bubble and bubble. In. So I think if we did more of that, and we put the testing calendar out there at the beginning of the year and said, this is what's going to be tested. I'm, I want my parents to know. I'm, I'll have an open house. I'll tell you all about the tripod survey. I, I, I think that it's healthy for us to do this. Uh, but I don't want parents to feel ambushed by what? Another thing that's coming? So that's communication piece. And then internally, it's doing our job the way that I think you would say teachers do their job naturally. Is do you really have this? Come on, we're going to walk down the hall. We should tell them everything you know about nouns. Right now. Okay, I think you got it. You don't need a. is because when children just like as an administrator when your staff feels valued they perform better and that's in business education whatever field the same as in a classroom when the students feel valued by their teacher which is the point of this I get that I understand it it's relying on feedback I just feel that there is a much better way to do it than bombarding children with another test. Um, you know, if it's about feeling value, could it not be a conversation? I, mean, I know you can't assign a number, but our children aren't numbers, they're children. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's from a mother of a kindergartner and a kindergarten teacher. Yeah. And I feel like it's extremely intrusive. I don't feel like they were very transparent at all. I think they were very open about this is about how your teacher makes your child feel. There was no mention of any of the questions, the demographic questions, the nosy questions. Yeah. It's kind of like they just snuck it in there. I agree. You know, we know it's about the teacher, yeah. and yet we're throwing these in there. The parent doesn't. Yeah. You know, and that doesn't really build trust with the no. public schools. And I agree. Parents. Especially, especially at school like Hayfield, the parents are already kind of with that language barrier. Well, right. And they're they're already like, wait a minute, they're asking right. these questions about our right. house. And they're here without documentation. And, and it makes them even more standoffish <laughs> because now they're like they're trying to I got it. sneak in things about our lives yeah. that maybe they don't want to tell us. I, I agree. Okay, I think we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope it was helpful. I hope you got some good information. And if you want to go to this link. You know, just Google it, Cambridge and Tripod. Lots of really good videos. Show them to your teachers at the beginning of the year. They'll they'll say, Yay, you found something we didn't know. Thanks.